Good afternoon, my magical people. Welcome. You are watching the Greater Chicagoland Pagan Pride Twitch stream. Uh, this is going to be the first of our workshops for the day. We do have four uh, keynote workshops that we wanted to open up to be able to let as many people watch as possible. And we're kicking it off in the best way possible with one of our local superstars in the Chicago area, Laura Gonzalez. Uh, she is the founder and priestess of the Fraternity of the Goddess Fortuna Temple. She is a, a local pagan pillar of the community. Uh, she has been a reader, speaker, teacher at Chicago Pagan Pride, as well as many other local pagan prides throughout the uh, Illinois area and Midwest area. And she is here with us today to discuss the healing arts of Mexico. So with no further ado, I am going to turn it over to Laura Gonzalez to bring you a phenomenal, phenomenal presentation. Laura? Hello, everybody. Good morning. I hope everybody's doing great. Good morning for real this time. I'm always saying good morning to people, and it's usually on the afternoon. <laughs> so it's, it's good to be... Um, here with you all and it's good to be somewhat early. For those who don't know me, uh, thank you so much, Matt, for that uh, rock star presentation. I felt very well to be called the superstar. <laughs> That's funny. Um, I'm a priestess of the goddess on the Dianic tradition. I am the founder of Temple, the Fortuna Temple uh, of Chicago. And I am part of the minister's training program with Circle Sanctuary. I'm also a podcaster. I have a couple of podcasts on the Circle Sanctuary Network podcast. One is uh, Bilingual English Spanish Lunatic Mondays, Lunas Lunaticos. And I also produce and sometimes conduct uh, Paganos del Mundo, which uh, features Pagans of the World, as the name, or Pagados del Mundo. And that one is in uh, Spanish and Portuguese. So I'm a little busy. I'm also a tarot reader, a healer, and what I jokingly said uh, for the last 12 years, your local witch for hire. Pew, pew. So today I am tapping into the culture of my homeland. For those who don't know, I'm Mexican. I'm from Mexico City. I was born and raised there. I'm very close to be half my life here in Chicago because I came here when I was 25 years old. And I've been here for 22 years. So it's almost half and half. Uh, very happy to be here with you all in uh, Pagan Pride Day Chicago. And as always, I want to give a shout out to the Greater Chicago Land Pagan Pride Organization team, uh, Twyla, Matt, and everybody else whose names probably escaped my mind at this moment. But uh, talk about an uh, engine that is very well directed and is doing the things because with the challenges of 2020, here we are bringing to you this wonderful uh, Chicago Pig and Pride. So without further ado, let me uh, start talking to you about the healing arts of Mexico. And I'm talking way, way back. I'm talking before the time of colonizers, of course. And I'm talking um, about the Mexica Tenochca people, the so-called Aztec people in Mexico. And um, sorry, my dog just opened my door. So I got to push the door back out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the Mexican, the Mexica people, the Aztecs have a very um, bad reputation. It is believed that they used to do um, human sacrifices and that they were very violent people and that they were um, savages. And of course, this is the account of the colonizers, right? Because the story is usually told by those who win the war and these people came and maim and destroy and kill. And then they told the story that they wanted to tell. But the truth of the matter is that um, researchers are still going to the living places in Mexico where there is still living um, 
people who conserve the language of our people. And as you may know, um, culture is being conserved by the language. I'm gonna take off my headphones because I am not hearing you. So I don't need to have my headphones at this moment. <laughs> I just realized that, realized that silly thing. So anyway, um, they we were um, labeled as savages. And the truth of the matter is that the researchers that are now uh, investigating and going to the little towns, to the mountains, to the secluded areas where there are still living people who speak the language are compiling all this information. And the most important part of it all is, um, of course, the official channels from Mexico don't want that information out because, you know, it's like you've been telling a lie for so long. How are you going to deconstruct or how are you going to tell on yourself that you've been sharing a lie? So it makes sense that, you know, this is kind of hush hush. And <clears throat> excuse me, for those who speak Spanish, please look up um, Maestro Arturo Mesa Gutierrez. And he has a wonderful collection of books where all this information is being shared. Um, but going into the practices, the actual practices, um, they were mostly preventive practices, the healing and the holistic well-being of people in Mexico. It was truly holistic. It was truly um, preventive and it um, encompassed all four bodies of the human life, you know. Um, it was all about uh, connection with others. It was all about connection with yourself, introspection, moments of clarity and calmness, meditation, if you will, uh, disciplinary exercise and um, practices to keep the body active and also an intellectual development. So mentally, emotionally, physically, and spiritually, if you will. Now, it is say nowadays that the, Me the Mexica, that the Aztecs were very religious, that, oh my God, the Aztecs have this pantheon that has about 300 gods and goddesses and uh, demons and destroyers and creators and all this kind of stuff. And the truth of the matter is that our people did not have a religion. It's not a religion. Um, it was a philosophy of life. It is a philosophy of life because there are people who still practice like this. And all of these gods and goddesses that if you Google uh, as the gods, the list is infinite. Um, there were aspects of nature and these aspects of nature were anthropom anthropomorphized by um, the people, our people, the Mexica people. I will probably continue calling them Aztecs because that's how most people know them as Aztecs, but the actual correct name of our people was the Mexica Tenochka people. But for all intents and purposes and for practicality, I will say Aztecs. Um, so they um, anthropomorphize those forces of nature and give them uh, personality and qualities and attributes, of course, that were very human because in order to understand everything that happens around in our life and everything that happens in nature, we have to see it from the filter of humanity. So we have concepts such as Tlaloc, the, the god of the rain and the water and the water that sucks the land and that uh, concept of Tlaloc, of course, it was not a god, but it was more a concept of uh, understanding things truly and getting in depth um, what happens when it's there's a heavy rain and how the land and the soil get really, really uh, wet. And that is that is what Tlaloc means, you know, it's not a god of the rain. It's actually being soaked on something and having the deep understanding of your emotions and so on and so forth. You know, I could be, I could continue talking about very many of the, of the gods and goddesses. I have here uh, Quetzalcoatl on my earrings. And for some people, it will look like the Ouroboros. 
Um, and it's a concept of, again, you know, this was all the great God Quetzalcoatl. Quetzalcoatl mean, uh, Quetzal is uh, the name, what they use for beautiful, and coat will be snake, so the beautiful snake. And just so you understand how they use these analogies in the language, Quetzalcoatl, the beautiful snake. What they were talking about is everything that vibrates, every, every vibration, right? And so to them, life itself, it was a beautiful vibration. So that that's why life and creation and everything that is alive and thriving with life was Quetzalcoatl, because it's the beautiful vibration of life. So when we um, start learning the language and where the words come from and what do they mean exactly, we understand that uh, constricting these concepts to gods and goddesses is doing a disservice of the philosophy of the Mexica Tenochka people. Um, of course, when the colonizers came, their narrow vision of the world was infused with fear, with a religion that is filled with rewards and punishments and where people would behave properly. So out of fear and out of being complacent to the powers to be and in order not to go to a place that is strictly created for punishment. Now, I want to do a little parenthesis here. I am not bashing any religion. Everybody, I strongly and truly believe within my heart that every religion and every person that practice any type of spirituality should be free to practice that. I am using the anecdotes and the historic uh, facts, the few story facts that I know, uh, to exemplify it and to explain what happened to our people. And the truth of the matter is, imagine uh, the aliens coming to the earth at this moment and seeing everything that we see with our metaphors and our analogies and our phones and how we have the world in our hands. And if we were to tell aliens, you know, I have the world on my hands here. I can uh, investigate research and do things with this apparatus they're going to believe that it's some kind of magical, weird, uh, intense, hellish, demonic thing, you know? So when the Spaniards came, when the colonizers came, they couldn't understand either what um, our people were practicing. And think about a culture that after it was put through war, through conquest, through um, slavery, because we were slaves for 300 years. And then all these traditions and cultural practices and preventive holistic practices start resurfacing a little bit. And then you see the Mexica people walking around. It is said that they will walk around fanning them, themselves with flowers. Think about the beauty of it. You know, you're walking around and you're finding yourself with maybe lilies of the valley or maybe a marigold or a rose and the, the scent. Talk about aromatherapy. <laughs> you know? The scent of the flowers keeping you sane. Or um, these ancient folks just sitting down under a tree and closing their eyes in meditation and contemplation. And that is one of the holistic practices that it was very, very uh, infused in the Mexican, the healing arts of Mexico. It was introspection, contemplation, meditation, and observation. When you go deep into the knowledge of our people, it is so vast. There, there is uh, mathematics and astrology and astronomy and of course the cycles of the earth and the healing powers of herbs and food and the diet. We were mostly um, what now will be considered vegan uh, or people were mostly vegan. We didn't have all these animals 
that were introduced by the colonizers. So our diets were different. And I, it pains me to say, because I do have the biggest insect phobia in the world, but our people will eat a lot of insects and that's where they get, um, they used to get a lot of the protein and I guess the crunchy factor of the food. <laughs> but, um, but mostly the diet was um, vegan. So what is now known as uh, traditional Mexican food is actually uh, an amalgamation of the colonizers food with the indigenous food. Um, but anyway, let's go back to um, preventive practices, right? The contemplation and the observation of nature. Our people were so wise that they had not only one, <clears throat> excuse me, not only one calendar, but a series of calendars, excuse me. And in those calendars, I always laugh because everybody talks about the Mayan calendar and they put the Aztec calendar on the imagery, uh, <laughs> you know, when it was 2012 and everybody was like, oh my God, the Mayans said the, uh, the world is gonna end and what they were posting, it was the Aztec calendar. So no, there was not just one calendar, there was a series of calendars and all these calendars, each region had their own language and their own understanding, but most of these calendars, you know, they will count cycles and they will break them down because they have this amazing, system of observation of nature and so every holiday every calendar every month um it was very well defined according to what was happening on the earth what was happening on the earth so for those who are familiar with the um, wheel of the year i have to tell you that the Aztec calendar has nothing to the wheel of the year it's really very precise and very um, attuned with, with the cycles of nature. And so there was that part of the preventive holistic healing is knowing when to plant, knowing when to harvest, knowing when to be out and active, knowing when to withdraw in contemplation, knowing when to go home and do nothing, right? Knowing when to save yourself for probably the cold months, though in Mexico, we didn't get as cold as in Chicago. Um, but let me digress for a minute because I am forgetting something. I, If you ever took a class with me, you know, I barely ever have notes and everything I'm telling you is from memory. So I have to digress because I forgot something that is really, really important. Um, we are here in the frame of this event that is called uh, Pagan Pride Day, right? These practices, please, let's be very clear. It's very important that I tell you, these are not pagan practices, okay? The native peoples of the Americas don't like to be called pagan. I learned that one too long ago, and I try to always pass it down to people. Why? There is a historic heaviness to the word pagan. When the colonizers came with their immense ignorance and their immense superstition, what they saw was to their eyes, anything that was not their, their God or their Christ or their practice was deemed as evil. So when they came to America from Alaska to Tierra del Fuego and you know, north and south, east and west of all of the one American continent. Um, they saw the practices of, of our people, of the native people of the America, and they deem everything as evil. And of course, in order to condemn the evilness that they saw, they will accuse them of paganism and witchcraft. So the native people of America were colonized, were murdered, were tortured, and they were condemned by the colonizers for being pagan and being witches. So we have to understand the heavy, heavy, heavy um, content of the word pagan and how we cannot see these native practices from which we get inspired, 
get knowledge, follow that knowledge, and reclaim the, not necessarily the exact practices, but the mythology, the, met the metaphors, and most importantly, the information, uh, we want to relive and go back to understand those philosophies, but we cannot do the disservice to this living culture because they are still alive and call them pagan. That is a very disrespectful thing to do. There are native peoples and there are native practices. And I have to make this, um, to clarify this because I have been told, and I had made the mistake of calling native practices pagan. Why? Because they are earth-based, but words carry meaning, see? And for people who were murdered and maimed and killed and raped and basically tried to be erased in the name of you are a pagan, you are a witch, we, the, the descendants of those people, um, we the Mexicans cannot call those practices pagan because we will be recolonizing our own culture. And the idea is to decolonize the culture. That's why I decided today to speak about the healing arts of Mexico, um, because even though I'm a pagan priestess and I'm a witch and um, I practice uh, paganism, of course, I always say I practice paganism, but I also practice the native philosophies. And there are two, two separate things. To the untrained eye, it looks like it's exactly the same because it's earth-based um, spirituality, philosophy, and or religion. But we have to make sure that we make those differences. So that being said, uh, one of the most important healing arts of Mexico is prevention. So yes, I'm gonna to talk to you about herbs and I'm gonna to talk to you about the Temascal and the sweat lodge and things that you can do to help repair your health. But the most important part of my talk today has to be about uh, prevention and Again, I forgot to tell you folks to hold your questions for the end because we're gonna open for Q&A. Um, but anyway, so reflection and contemplation was really important for our people. And believe me, believe me when I tell you, they had uh, breathing exercises and they have um, very, very disciplined um, meditation, contemplation time. It was done, it was supposed to be done in the morning you know, when you woke up in the morning, uh, listen to where your dreams were and probably journal. I don't know how easy it would have been to journal back then, but as we try to reclaim that, um, that culture, uh, you do your dream journaling, right? In the morning, you wake up in the morning and you write down your dreams. And I always tell people, uh, because I also do dream, dream interpretation for those who don't know, um, it is important to write your dreams very important to write your dreams. And if you don't understand your dreams the day you dream about it, I will say go back a week and then look at your journal and then you might find some uh, gold, some gems there. Um, also, physical activity was really, really important. Uh, walking, hiking, and tracking, and um, swimming, of course, for the peoples that were close to the ocean, any physical activity, it was seen as an honorability to your body, you know, to move, to dance. Dancing was one of the most important activities for our people, and it was a very ritualistic um, aspect of their life. And again, is it was not a religion, but it was sacred. They see the sacredness of everything that is alive, and the ritual of dancing and the ritual to offer that sacred energy to back to the energies of the earth. Um, so of course, it was easy for the colonizers to mistake all of this as a religion, right? Because when a, when a people um, group of people have these disciplines and they are so ingrained and they are so part of their culture and their life. And you see that everybody does it. Of course, they, with their narrow mind of religion, they thought this has to be part of their religion. And our people will dance to, the, to a point where they were ecstatic and they were giving that energy to the, 
to the um, elements, to nature. And sometimes they will collapse, right? Because they will dance, dance, dance for so long, they will collapse. And then of course the colonizers, you know, think about it like, oh my God, they're possessed by a demon and you know, that's it. No wonder they try to eradicate all this culture because it will be scary. If you don't understand what's happening, it will be scary. So dancing, moving, having contemplation, having a, a time for meditation, and also quite important, again, the diet. The diet of the Mexica people, the uh, Aztec people, was something that will live modern nutritionists and dietitians, uh, you know, in awe. Because our people somehow, they knew about the nutrients, about proteins, about, you know, everything that is good. So yes, it's not a secret that I've been vegan for seven months now. I am not trying to convert you. I never will. You do you, boo. But our people had a mostly 75 or maybe 90% vegan diet. And it was the combination of all of these nutrients and foods and vitamins and proteins and whatnot. And of course, the base of it is uh, beans, right? Um, it is somewhat hurtful to think that after the colonizers came and how it has become a joke right um they even call us a derogatory name related to beans but the truth of the matter is it has to do with the wisdom of our people and the nutrition and we know that beans are very nutritious they have an immense amount of protein fiber and energy of course so if you have beans on your diet every day is the best preventive way of conserving your health uh, so again the healings are the healing arts of mexico are not so much this uh hocus pocus oh my god they do this and they do that and uh, they're so mystical and so magical it was mostly preventive healing so uh, fruits and vegetables, grains, and of course, corn. We are the people of the corn. We have uh, corn masa tortillas and tamales and atole, by the way. Uh, you all speak Nahuatl. Every time you ask for one of those uh, delicious foods at your local Mexican restaurants in here in Chicago, we have the best in Pilsen and Little Village and Cicero and where everywhere um but tamales atole taco tortilla those are all nahuatl words and guacamole for the love of god call it guacamole it is colonizing and it is a mentality of um recolonizing our people when people call it guac and it's really offensive by the way so please call it guacamole and you will be speaking nahuatl um and all of those peoples are so all of I'm sorry, all of those foods are very nutritiously heavy. Um, they have all the nutrition, all the proteins, all the vitamins that our body needs. And it's actually um, a culture in Mexico going back to uh, what they call the milpa diet. Milpa is like the farm or the little, the little farmland, you know, it's called milpa. And now, uh, <laughs> is being re-embraced. Um, not that it was never embraced, but it's being more because we live on a global world of communication. Now it's more imperative that everybody's doing it. So uh, the three sisters that will be, um, oh, let me see if I remember. It's corn, uh, beans, and I think it's zucchini. Um, yeah, I think it's zucchini. So the three sisters, and all these three foods give you everything you need. Everything you need. Again, I'm not telling you to become vegan. You do you. But um, it is a win-win-win situation. Because when we lower our intake of animal products, we help save the planet. And as pagans and earth-based religious people, I think we all are interested in saving the planet. Um, 
It gives you all the nutrients, vitamins, minerals, and everything you need, and it's delicious. And I'll tell you what, there is no one combination of vegetables that doesn't taste good. Take it from me that I've been cooking every day for the last seven months. Um, so our people knew when to plant, when to harvest, how to use these herbs and how to use these vegetables, how to combine them together. And if you think about culinary um, arts nowadays, uh, whether you have animal product or not, what gives flavor to your food is vegetables. And what gives flavor to your food is all the spices that you put on the food. I mean, we were conquest. We were conquered because spices. Uh, for those who don't know, see uh, Christopher Columbus trips and how he was an idiot that got lost and came to our land, but he was looking for spices. So the spices are mostly vegetable process, herbs and, and vegetables. So even when you eat animal products, you are trying to make them flavor, you're trying to flavor them with vegetables and spices. So there you go. Um, so our people, everybody knew how to treat the land. Everybody knew which herbs were good for what, what to use when, when a person was pregnant or a person was about to give birth or had just given birth to their child or when a person had uh, an illness or uh, body aches or whatnot, they knew which herbs to use and how to use them. Sometimes they will rub them, sometimes they will drink teas, sometimes they will do these washes that I'm gonna talk about later. It's called temascales. Um, so this is what happened and this is my theory and I have talked to Maestro Mesa and he agrees that this theory could be true. So take it with a grain of salt. If you have a society where everybody knows that everybody knows how to heal with herbs, the curandera was not one curandera. There was everybody knew how to heal. Everybody, curandera is healer by those who don't know. So everybody was a curandera because everybody knew how to heal. Then enter the colonizers that tell you to be a healer is to be a witch and to be a witch is to be evil. And to be evil, you're gonna get killed or you're gonna bring um, a curse or malignant um, situations into your land. So think about the level of paranoia that reigned in Mexico after the colonizers came. Because now you're telling that everybody that knows everything can harm everybody else. I'm sorry, I have to let my dog out because he's gone crazy. Okay, go. Pardon me, please. <laughs> That's what happened when you have three kids. Um, anywho, level of par paranoia within the Mexican population. Now we're talking probably a hundred years after uh, colonization. And what happened is we have become, unfortunately, extremely religious because they took our practices, chew them and mix them with their religion and they send them back to us. So now all these concepts of Quetzalcoatl and Tezcatlipoca and Ejecat and Cuatlique and all of this um, forces of nature have become gods and they explain it back to people as religion. And that's what became the Aztec religion. The Aztec religion is actually Spanish religion. There is no Aztec religion. So, there is this huge level of paranoia. So of course, the 20, 20th and 21st century healers who conserve the uses and customs and traditions are now seen as witches as, and as something you know to be feared. And now everybody fears everybody and long are gone our um, culture of contemplation and accountability and uh, self-healing and prevention. Unfortunately, the colonizers took most of that away from us, but not all of it, because here we are trying to reclaim and try to uh, understand back again um, how this works. So we have about 15 minutes, we have about 10 minutes left. So I wanna talk to you about the mascales. 
And because I cannot tell you all this about the healing arts of Mexico and don't give you a little bit of how and what to do, right? So at the Mascal, the Mascal is called the Mascal and um, is basically will be translated as a sweat lodge. And yes, the people of America from Alaska to Patagonia, they used to do sweat lodges and they are very, very similar. I am, um, I know people who are working in to get in one uh, close to Chicago that will be a multi-ethnic and multicultural one. I know of people that have Temascales here in Chicago, but I know they're private people and it's part of the private practice. So unfortunately I cannot share that information with you because I'm not, a, I'm, it's just not mine to share. But a Temascal is basically a structure. You've seen them, the sweat lodges, right? It's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a half of a pot and that's exactly what it needs to look because it's emulating the womb of the um, person who birthed you. I'm trying to be inclusive on my um, language. I think that's the correct way to say it. So it, it is simulating the uterus and it's simulating the womb from which we all came. And in this case, the womb of the earth. And it's supposed to be hot and dark and moist because if you know a little bit of biology, that's what the womb is. We are born from water and we are water uh, entities. So the Temascal is trying to emulate that, you know, it's a rebirth of sorts and it is um, birthing back again into life. And it's supposed to be that you go and sweat to eliminate some toxins. Now, it's very important for me to tell you our body already eliminate toxins. You don't have to do juices. You don't have to do washes. You don't have to fast. We have kidneys and we have a liver. And those are the organs in our body that do that every day. And every day you wake up in the morning and you go to the bathroom because you are detoxifying already. So you do not need to detoxify. All that uh, new age um, who have, don't do that because it's unnecessary. Um, also, by the way, uh, cacao ceremonies, there's one on every yoga place in Chicago. Please don't do that. It's unethical. It's part of cultural appropriation. And unless it's a Mexican people or is a person who learned from the Mexica people how to do a cacao ceremony, otherwise it's cultural appropriation. Yes, I said it. So Atemascal is going back to the womb of the mother. And of course, ideally, we will have right that uh, half pot that is on the land and it's got the hole in the center and the um, heated stones. And then there's water that is being poured so to create moist moisture and to heal. And our people, unlike the people of what is now the United States that only pour water, our people will have that water infused with herbs. And so you will go to the Temascal and it will have specific herbs that create the moisture. So nowadays it's nearly impossible because there are no Temascales here, at least not that I know in Chicago, other than, as I said, the ones that I know that were private, they are private. Um, but fear not, you can do your own uh, wash healing mini tiny temascal at home and you can do two ways so the first way that I recommend and it's the safest one and it's easy to do on your own is get some water boiling get get a big pot where you can get a big bucket where you can put your feet and get a pot of healing there's a lot of noise that is distracting me Get a big bucket, get a, a pot of water, bring it to a boil, put your herbs in the water, and then pour the water with the herbs on the bucket and put a little bit of cold water so you can soak your feet in it, but don't burn yourself. Please make sure it's not too hot, right? Common sense, people, like every other practice. 
Uh, you can do this in a full moon. You can do this in a new moon. You can do this when you feel that you need it. When you're feeling sick, do it. And you can use different, different herbs that will help you, right? So some examples, um, Arnica is really good for healing pain and for inflammation. So you can use that. Um, I'm trying to read. For when we have any kind of respiratory situations, you know, we can do basal because basal helps with the lungs and the chest. Um, to relax your muscles, you can use orange blum, orange, orange blossoms, right? And eucalyptus is also for breathing uh, and is antiseptic and it helps keep your skin beautiful. And uh, Melissa, Melissa helps to relax. So remember that all of these were used as preventive um, healing situations, right? They were not after the fact, but some of them can be used. Um, rosemary is also good for uh, relaxing your muscles and bringing healing to your body, to your physical body. And of course, chamomile helps with indigestion. It helps with stomach problems, same as um, peppermint and laurel. They also help with stomach stuff. And um, I think those are the ones that I have because those are the ones that I was able to translate. The rest are all in Spanish, but I have a little booklet. And if you have questions, I can help you privately with those. So the, the easy, safe way is get a big bucket where you can put your feet, uh, get a pot of water boiling on the stove, put the herbs on it, let it boil with the herbs. Once it's been boiling for maybe like two, three minutes, throw it on the bucket, add some cold water so you don't burn yourself, and then soak your feet in there. And when you're doing that, please, for the love of the goddess, relax. Let the, let the um, moisture, let, let the uh, fumes come into your lungs, breathe it in and relax and chill and give yourself pause. You know, uh, some people were saying because COVID, everything has been stopped and everything has been paused. But the truth of the matter is a lot of us are doing a lot of stuff because we're doing a lot of stuff online. So we think we're not doing much because capitalism mentality. And the truth is we've been doing a lot. So give yourself a minute to just chill and relax, you know, to sit down and to be with yourself to center and to find that moment of calmness. So that's the one mini tiny temascal that you can do at home It's a food wash. The second one I recommend that you do with a friend or with your spouse, with your partner. Don't do it on your own because it's a little bit more intense and it could be dangerous. It could be dangerous because people get so relaxed. They could fall asleep and if they fall asleep, that's too much heat, too much moisture, and that will be not good. So the second one is a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> you need a shower curtain, a plastic shower curtain, and you need a sheet, a cotton sheet, like from your bed, and you need a chair, and you need, again, a, a big bucket of water and uh, your boiling water. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go into your bathroom, and whether you have a tub or a standing shower, you're gonna put a chair in the bathroom and then you're gonna put the bucket under the chair, right? And that's where your helper, the person that is gonna help you come to play because you're gonna put this, the uh, cloth sheet um, on the chair, then you're gonna sit in there, you're gonna wrap yourself on the cloth sheet and the person that helps you is going to bring you the water with the herbs and then they're going to put the water in the bucket and you're not going to put your feet in there you're just going to let the water there because that is going to be like super hot right and then you're going to wrap yourself around with the sheet and this is the craziest part of it you're going to put the shower liner the plastic shower curtain on top of it 
You're gonna cover your head too. This is the modern super tiny homemade Temazcal. Please don't stay there more than 10 or 15 minutes. If you feel that you're having trouble breathing for the love of the goddess, get out of there. It's okay if you cannot take all 15 minutes on it. Even if you take two or three minutes, that's fine because the herbs and the um, smoke, it's not smoke, it's what is it? I cannot think of the name, uh, English. <laughs> English is a second language, sorry. Um, the fumes, the moisture, the smoke, the vapor, thank you, the vapors. Uh, even if you cannot take the vapors from the water for the whole 15 minutes, if you can take it for five minutes, that's fine. But make sure that you are doing this in the company of somebody that can help you. And the minute you feel that you cannot breathe anymore, that is too much moisture, just get out of there, you know, and then uh, let like 15, 20 minutes go by and then switch, you know, let the other person uh, help you with the process. Now you're going to help them with the process. So this, this hot water thing, again, you need the chair that can be, that is water resistant, uh, could be a plastic chair. You need a um, cotton sheet and you need a plastic liner for the shower and the big bucket of water, right? You're gonna boil it, you're gonna put the herbs in it, you're gonna let it simmer, boiling, and then you're gonna put that um, underneath the chair. And then you're gonna cover yourself with the cotton cloth um, sheet and then you're gonna put the shower liner on top of you and you're gonna let it let yourself sweat and let yourself get soaked with your own sweating and the vapor from the water. It's beautiful. If you can do it, please, please, I'm looking at you. Do it with help. Don't do it on your own because it could be dangerous. Some people get too, 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 too relaxed and they just fall asleep and that is not good. Um, but if you cannot do either of those, have a tea. I mean, literally have a tea, you know, heat, heat up the water, put your herbs in it and drink it. And with uh, like everything with magic is intention. Remember about the intention, you know, have a tea, but don't just make the tea and say, okay, I have to drink this tea because I need to keep running around and go to my next Zoom meeting or teach the kids or do the e-learning. No, have your tea, give yourself for the love of the goddess, give yourself 10 minutes sit, relax, and drink your tea. And think about, bring your intention about the healing that you're bringing into your body. I think um, this is enough, <laughs> Matt, if you are there. I know you're there, Matt. Um, this will be it. I thank you all for being here today. I will open up for questions. And I thank you all for watching, whoever many people are there. Remember, I'm going to be reading tarot afterwards. And um, that's going to be on the uh, Discord platform. And as always, never forget that you are loved. Thank you for being here. And if there's any questions, I hang out here for another 10 minutes. Thank you so much for that, Laura. That was a phenomenal amount of information. Uh, looking right now, I'm not seeing any comments. So if those of you who are on the Twitch channel, if you have some questions for Laura, please pop them into the chat room and we can... Uh, yeah. I can forward those on to Laura. Let me do a little. So we've got one question popped in. Uh, I heard the Aztecs cool. use hot chocolate for many things. What do you know about that? Not much. And that's why I don't do a cacao ceremony, cocoa ceremony. Uh, hot chocolate. Okay. So the way the Aztecs drink the hot chocolate was hot cacao, no sugar, no milk. And it's bitter. And it's not chocolate milk. And it was a ceremonial drink and it was shared in community. And again, our people were not religious. They were very sacred. They, they saw sacredness on everything. So every aspect of their life was about community, was about sacredness, was about the cycles of the earth and honoring the earth. So yeah, the cacao ceremony, the drinking of the cacao was in community and it was done with a purpose and it was done 
with uh, a, in a ceremonious way and it was bitter and it was hot cocoa it was hot cacao um and what i said when i said yes i said it is because i it hurts me to see all the cultural appropriation happening especially here in chicago where we have one mexican in every other corner and that all these yoga places and new age places have a white person with a turban doing a cacao ceremony like what is that about uh but yeah i know culturally that uh, first of all, cacao originated in Mexico. Uh, so from Mexico to the world, believe it or not, please research and know that I'm not lying to you. Vanilla, tomato, and chocolate. Those are three of the very many contributions of Mexico to the world. To the world. And the cacao originated in Mexico, the chocolate, right? Uh, also the uh, flower for Christmas that you call it I cannot remember what it's called, but we call it Nochebuena, you know, because it, it flowers in Christmas, the red flower, beautiful flower, they're originally from Mexico. So about the chocolate, the cacao ceremony, I don't know a whole lot, so please forgive me, but what I know is that it was ceremonial, that it was done in community and that it was bitter. And I think when it's drank in a certain way or under certain circumstances, it helps to create an altered state of mind but don't take my word for it because I don't know a whole lot. But thank you for the question. I will research. All right, so that's all we have right now. Um, Laura, can you, Tell everybody where they can find you and if they want to learn a little bit more about the things that you do or connect with you outside of Twitch, how can they connect with you? Of course. My website is www.brujalauragonzalez. That is a B as in boy, R-U-J-A. And then my name, Laura, L-A-U-R-A, Gonzalez, G O N. Z A L E Z, but with a C. So, brujalauragonzalez.com. That is my website. But like everybody else and their cousin, I'm on Facebook. So, the easiest way to find me is on Facebook. You can find me at Terra by Laura Gonzalez on Facebook. I do videos um, about tarot every week. On Monday, I do the tarot reading for the week. On Wednesday, I do oracles. And on Friday, I'm doing learning the card of the day. That happens on my Facebook page every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 12 o'clock at noon. Um, so you can find me there. You can also find me on Instagram as Magia Serati. That is a weird name, but I cannot change it anymore. It's M-A-J-I-A, -A C as in car, E-R-A-T-I, Magia Serati. And that's me. That's um, so. That's the Facebook. That's the Instagram. That's uh, the YouTube. It's also Tarot by Laura Gonzalez. And on YouTube, I have mostly all the videos that I do for Tarot. But I have also some videos that I have contributed or done classes. Excuse me. So you can uh, go find them. And I'm also part of this uh, mystic chat video blog and there is a facebook page that is called mystic chat video blog with my dear friend and colleague chris allen and some other people from chicago ruby roos and luke bab and we do this uh, mystic chat video blog twice a month on a thursday evening and there is so far about 19 uh, episodes of the mystic chat video blog you can find it on facebook those you can also find on YouTube on the Chris Allen page, and you can find them on um, Spotify and iTunes. And of course, you can find me on my podcasts. I do the Lunatic Mondays, Lunes Lunaticos bilingual podcast. Uh, there is a Facebook page for that. Uh, Lunatic Mondays, Lunes Lunaticos. One, the first week of the month is on Spanish the second and fourth week of the month on monday obviously is in english so the first monday of the month is in spanish second and fourth is in english they are all uh, new interviews i barely ever uh, do anchor presentations 
Next uh, Monday, the 12th, I will be interviewing Dr. Jean Shinoda Bolin. And on the 26th of October, I will be interviewing Phyllis Kurot, uh, who is also one of our uh, speakers today on Pagan Pride. And uh, I also produce and create some content for Paganos del Mundo. That is a bilingual uh, podcast as well. That is on um, part of the CSM podcast, the Circle Sanctuary Network podcast. And you can find me on all those pages, the Lunatic Mondays page, the CSM podcast page, the uh, Paganos del Mundo page. You can find me on the video, uh, Mystic Chat video blog page. But most importantly, you can find me on the Terra by Laura Gonzalez uh, Facebook page. Um, Twitter is Terra by Laura. Instagram is Magia Cerati, www.brujalauragonzalez.com. And last but not least, I do have a Facebook page that is my personal Facebook page, Laura Gonzalez, but I don't add people unless I know you. So if I don't know you, you can follow me on all of the other platforms. And of course, there is also a page for the uh, Fraternity of the Goddess Fortuna Temple. And I am currently only doing uh, teaching some of my students basic Wicca um, online. The temple is on hiatus because obviously I cannot in a sane mind open for services right now, but we are hoping that eventually we will start doing online ceremonies. For now, I've been contributing with Circle Sanctuary online ceremonies and we have been doing the full moon ceremonies and those have been shared on the um, Fraternity of the Goddess Temple, Fortuna Temple page. And also there is a Fraternidad de la Diosa, uh, Templo de la Diosa page in Spanish. So if you don't find me on Facebook, it's because you're not looking for me because I'm all over and I'm everywhere. <laughs> Thank you, Matt, for asking that because I never do all that much of explaining all of the pages and all of the places that I am. So thank you so much for asking and thank you all for being here. And thank you, Greater Chicago Land Pagan Pride for hosting this event. And thank you so much, particularly, I know there's a great team of volunteers behind all of this, but uh, most importantly, Matt and Twyla, I wanna thank you all for hosting us and for making this so effortlessly for us, the presenters.